Okay, hi everyone. Today I will be presenting the session in Introduction to AWS Cloud. I'm Alexander Zumov, Senior Solution Arch Architect from AWS. So today's agenda will be will be covering what is AWS Cloud overall, um, what it means from global reach, how we create our infrastructure to be globally. Um, what it means uh, from security perspective and comparison from on-premises and in AWS cloud. And later then we'll talk through the EC2 overview, some details of implementation and Lambda as a serverless solution. So let's start from the very beginning, I would say, and what is AWS overall? Really, it's a cloud provider that is highly reliable, scalable, and we provide with low-cost infrastructure platform that is spun over multiple countries all around the world. And the main benefits of the cloud of AWS cloud is ability to consume resources on demand, thus giving you low cost of the ownership of those resources, agility and elasticity of the services we provide, and open, flexible, so you could do whatever you want. Also security is, a, as we say in AWS, is a job zero. So we always start from the security. It's built in into all of our services and global reach, of course, it means we available all around the world. So what we think is AWS that set us apart from other vendors and providers. So basically our huge experience for the last 12 years and with the ability to create global infrastructure with all the skill and resiliency features built in and other things, but like in order to cover the main seven pieces uh, that I presented on the slide. So we think these seven pieces are what really stand out at AWS from other vendors. So first of all, we provide the most com comprehensive set of controls from terms of security. So you could do whatever you need from fine grain control abilities for in order to provide setup and infrastructure and access for all of users and with really fine grain controls. Breadth and depth of the services. We have 175 plus, so probably from the recent reInvent announcement, it probably is something around 200 more. And more so even like I am myself, it's really hard, hard to keep up with all these growing innovations in this space. So it's really huge amount of services and the, and the interpretation. Next thing is experience. So, so since we started in 2006, so it's almost 12, like 14 years from now, it's like millions of customers using AWS. It means for us, statistically, we have more workloads and more experience on handling those workloads. It means we learn on those uh, feedback from the customers and infrastructure as it grows. So it's really hard to compare this kind of experience. Global footprint. We'll be covering more details on the next slide, but mainly it's about how many geographic regions, availability zones we have around the world. Next thing is a machine learning. Machine learning is a we think and we have proven that the most of the workloads, I mean, many of them are happening on AWS than anyone else. And we ha have hands-on experience with many data scientists, data engineers that is using AWS services for machine learning and provide us with feedback so we could improve our existing service and provide more features based on the customer experience. Next is the ecosystem. So we have tens of thousand partners all around the world, and we have a marketplace where our partners could provide you with different ready to use software listing solutions that you available for you in the click of the button or the automated deployment into, into your, into your account. And it's already built for from the same perspective as all other services. So for you, it means just struggle consumption for this partner service. And enterprise leadership. So 
for many years, AWS was positioned as a leader and Gartner Magic Quadrant for the cloud infrastructure as a service. And I believe to my memory, it's like 10th consecutive year when we stand out as the leader in this Magic Quadrant. And let's talk about the main thing we really we really think that operational reliability and how we manage and operate our infrastructure at this scale, it's really what allow us to, to have this amount of services with this level of availability and durability and provide the best experience for our customers all around the world. First of all, because we have so many experiences since our very first product when it was used, it's mainly it's about our retail business, amazon.com, and uh, that is based on that experience, we already have the knowledge how to create uh, multi-region, multi-geographic spread infrastructure with a huge resilience built in and durability required for this kind of service. So based on top of this experience from even like our very first customers, customer, we really built it in, in our services. And since that time, we didn't stop on that and every year continue to improve this operational resiliency. So from terms of SLAs, uh, it is in the range of three nines to 100, where 100 it's uh, Route 53 hour DNS service that is wholly available. And that's why we are absolutely sure to provide 100% availability for that. And just to note from the Amazon S3, the object store that is really hugely used by our customers, it is designed for 11 nines durability. So it's a bit different from SLA perspective because it's not availability, but from durability perspective, it means what are the chance of losing one object out of like many of them? This is what is about durability. And in order to provide this resilience and for our infrastructure, we build availability zones. And that is, we have at least three in each region. And it means for each of availability zone, you could consider this as a separate availability zone at at least one data center in like common terms as you probably refer to that. And in each of those, we have isolated fault lines, planes, electrical grids, so everything is redundant, reliable, and isolated from any other availability zone. So this allows you to be really isolated from pieces of each other, but within the same region, when you leverage multiple availability zones, you could leverage high availability and resiliency because of that. Because the chance of that, all of that uh, multi-backup infrastructure all at once goes down is like none. It's almost non-existent. Also, we provide AWS Service Health, Health Dashboard. Uh, this is a web portal where you could see the current status of all the services provided by AWS running all over the world. So it's in real time in case of any possible degradations so or issues with service, you could go to the website and see whether there is such issue or not that is probably affecting you or not. Next big thing is about our price and philosophy. So we believe that cloud business is a really high scale, but low margin business. And it means that you need to be really operational, excellent in whatever you do in that. And AWS is really, really kind of it's okay with that because it's part of our core principles, how we build this business in order to be high volume, highly scalable and available to the customers. So what it means, we create a pricing model where you pay for what only use. So you really from CapEx, so capacity expenses, so like from regular uh, purchases that you used to probably, it you migrate to variable expense. It means you don't need to do the like contracts in advance if you don't need to. You only consume what you really need and you will pay for the portion of the services for like hour or minute that is really was consumed during that time. 
As the next portion, because of our high scale and many customers using our services, we could push back economies of scale to provide you with lower cost. It means because of scale and more resources consumed, we could have better price negotiations with our vendors, thus pushing this back to lower prices for ourselves and pushing this back to you as a lower prices for the services you consume. So this leads us to 85 or probably even more price reductions in the, since we launched AWS. Also, there are different pricing models to choose from to support different type of workloads uh, based on how often you use them um, like and what amount. So we have three pricing models. First one is called on demand. This is like a basic thing that is you just pay what you consume and that is. Second one is reserved instances or saving plans where you're really sure that you'll be using the servers or services for quite amount of time, like a year or three years. And you're pretty sure that those services will be there. You could just save on these and use the reserved instances. And it means you just commit to usage. And based on that, you could get a discount on the price. And third portion is a spot. Spot instances is really underused capacity because of the huge scale for the best cloud and seasonality. Like it's like it's a day in Europe, whereas it's night on in America. And due to that, probably balance of the workloads, uh, we have some spare workloads uh, in one portion of their globe. So you could leverage those underused capacity during this period of time. So this allows you to to get that discounts because of underuse capacity and we provide this as additional price and tier and also there is additional like vector to that where you could save even more it's like tiered pricing or volume discount or custom price it really depends on your commitment on the service and long term uh, like understanding of how many traffic you need or how many objects in s3 on something like that so you if you really think big amounts, you could get additional discounts based on that. And also, we really think that what allows us to grow uh, with this space of innovation, it's really our focus on the customer. So we call this customer obsessed. That means we really think and try to get feedback from our customers and work customers backwards in order to create our services. So what it leads to that 90% of our roadmap for the services originate from customer requests or feedback. And that is how we create our service and improve them. That is you who provided with, with feedback. And that is how you get the, those better services based on this. So please always provide the feedback. We're really open to that. Okay, let's talk about AWS Global Reach and what it means. First thing, it's uh, we have 24 regions. By these green dots on the map, you see the point, our presence or like where we have locations with the, our infrastructure in the region. And this is like in more to that, in addition to regions that is uh, consists of multiple availabilities zones, and I described before. In addition to that, we have cloud front point of presence. So because we all know that the closer to the customers, the better the experience, the minimal latency. So for in order to get the content to video streams or something like that, the better. So we create additional points of presence closer to our uh, group of customers all around the world in order to provide this level of experience. So you will be closer to that. It's in addition to our regions and mobility zones. And also we have uh, more than 100 direct connect locations. It means points where you could attach your like fiber channels or channels from your data center or your like uh, hardware to AWS Cloud Backbone Network allowing you to do this isolated channel with the high speed capacity and quality of service and the traffic. And on this 
White lines, uh, it's really kind of fibers. Uh, this is really AWS global network. It's created and owned by AWS solely. So we created it for our purpose only and nobody else using that. Uh, so all these white lines represents our connectivity, what we call our backbone network. So the network that allows you to connect from one region like in Frankfurt to US region in Oregon or North Virginia. And this is how it kind of created based on that. This allow us to guarantee the maximum throughput and quality of service for the traffic and the latency because it's all in our full possession control and we create the, our backbone network in order to sustain all the customer requirements from the bandwidth usage throughput perspective on others. And this is what we use as an cables for inter -Z. it means inter -Z, it's like between our availability zones within the same region and this is a cables to sustain this architecture infrastructure sort of that and it's once again it's totally controlled by amazon and aws and just a fun fact on the top on the bottom right corner with blue one is a cable from Australia where termites really like to the cable. So it's a special cable that prevents from that and making this not so easy to eat, I believe. And also we use a technology called dense with length division multiplex. And what it means in the regular fiber, when we use like light with a speed of light to transfer the traffic, you could do the multiplexing. It means you could split the uh, like split the light into different colors, and this is allows you to transfer uh, the data by using particular color color wavelength. So this allows us to even like improve the current capacity to more to more dimension because of using this technology. And just like three pictures of recent project that was created in an additional Beckmont network. You see here, this one from Australia to, uh, to US in red one. Um, next one from Japan to US in green on the screen. And Beta Bay Express is from uh, US, Tokyo and, and Taiwan as well. So let's speak about availability zones in a bit more details. So usually we have three availability zones in the region and sometimes it's even more, it could be five, six, in, like in the US uh, regions, for example. And really it's a discrete and separate data center with all the redundancy built in, networking power and connectivity uh, between other availability zones and other AWS regions. It's high throughput, low latency, and and it's it's built in by the needs in order to be like less than 100 kilometers. It allows from one perspective to provide resilience from the like any disaster, like I don't know floods or etc. So it means like uh, something that we can't control, like weather conditions, and usually based on the investigation if you do this in this kind of amount of span like 100 kilometers or something like that it's kind of limiting mitigating this possible weather condition in one particular piece so it won't affect others because of this uh, distribution and all the traffic bec between availability zones in the, is encrypted and this is how we connect uh, between the data centers, availability zones and uh, each other. As you see, like many lines grew green and blue ones. It means like each of those have connectivity with others through the transit centers. So it's all this additional backups lines and channels in order to be fully reliable. Okay, let's switch to the next topic is about security. And uh, in AWS, there is a we call this shared responsibility model. So there is some piece that is owned by the cloud, and this is the responsibility of AWS, what we call security of the cloud. And there is services pieces that you deploy on your own by the customer, and this is security in the clouds. And this is kind of separation 
of the responsibility between the customers and AWS as a cloud provider. As you see here, just to note some of them, so for hardware, storage, compute, uh, networking, it's on AWS and like everything you deploy there, like data, it's usually on the customers. And really we see on other, so like on the further slides, if you use Lambda, for example, there is less responsibility in you because it's like was offloaded to AWS as well. So this is a premise of like more serverless solution and services. And let's talk through the common similarities and uh, differences between uh, security in the cloud and on premises. So well, mostly there are many similarities. So there are same level layers of protection, subnets, networking, firewalls, three-tier architectures, DMZs, hardware, granular access for like principal for role-based MFA and encryption. So usually you find these uh, kind of requirements and features in both worlds in on premise in the cloud. But what are the difference? How we think about that is like you, you could use APIs for everything from the like provision your servers to the deployment. So everything is in could be controlled by API. Once again, it's a global reach. So usually if you build your own data center in like one or two or like locations, but it won't be global because it's just hard. And providing uh, due to the operational excellence out of the box, availability, durability, redundancy. So you don't need to pay for the second data center just for durability redundancy. It's already built in into a separate availability zones and you just pay for the resource you consume. Also, you have multiple layers of controls, firewalls on the networking, like security group and uh, on the resources, network access list on the subnet level and many others. We provide compliance as a code is possible because you could create infrastructure as code and, ever, and other things. So it's more general ability to control compliance. And also we create special Amazon images uh, for EC2 instances for virtual machines that is hardened. It means we already think from the security perspective what needs to be there and how often it needs to be updated to provide you with the latest security patches. Yeah, and let's talk through the benefits of this AWS security in addition to the uh, to the what I meant before. So from different services that provided out of the box uh, for you that you could leverage in AWS Cloud, first of all, it's visibility in inventory. You could leverage to like AWS config for that. We have plenty of security tools available for free, so you don't pay for usage of those. It's like security group and firewalls and like cloud. You, you have audit login in CloudTrail you could have DMZs via private subnets or VPC, virtual private cloud uh, features. And you could, have, you could have multiple VPCs in the same account in the same region, others to generally control and separate off your infrastructure from the networking and access perspective and user access control. And like many others uh, that you could leverage is available out of the box. Also, regions in data privacy compliance. So we have multiple regions, you already have presence. And because of the presence, particular regions, for example, in Germany, we have separate law, for example, like GDPR or any other local law that uh, requires you to store data locally in this country or in this region. So having this distributed geographical availability of our services by using these multiple 24 plus regions, you could store data in order to be compliant in this particular region. Next things is we provide you with uh, out of the box protection from DDoS. It's denial, distributed denial of service when some bot networks trying to kill your application by sending some uh, malicious requests. And this is called uh, AWS Shield, the service that is included in most of our services and available. And you even don't know it exists, but it's there. It's already allows you to mitigate these different types of attacks, especially like low level attacks, uh, like on L4, it's like scene floods, whatever. So 
won't be won't be deep dive into that but just to let you know there are many things where you already covered but for some comprehensive attacks for sure you need to leverage additional services uh, like and the blast web application firewall and you should properly configure your load balancing and after scaling to sustain the traffic growth security of economies of scale it means based on our most security oriented customers and we improve uh, our services to be complied for their requirements but as soon as we did this it's available for every customer it means every customer of aws already get the most comprehensive security uh, that is available and as i noted you don't need to create separate data center just for redundancy perspective it's already there due to a multiple redundant availability zones. Also, we cover some of these hardware replacement and upgrades uh, that you usually need to do in, in either case, but usually it's like transparent for you, the users of AWS Cloud. It's usually not so transparent when you use data center because you usually own a particular piece of hardware that needs to be replaced. So in AWS, we replace out of end of life hardware with the latest available processors. And even we improve this even further, like support of latest Intel instructions that allows you to do the encryption, like IAF algorithm, even like more performant than before. And from compliance perspective, I will show on the next slide, we already have many of our services compliant with the major compliance frameworks. Let me show you. So this is the list of so certificates starting from SOC, FIPS, ISO, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and et cetera, like PCI DSS and many others. So you could find those compliance certificate uh, like from our service called AWS Artifact uh, from your console and you could download them and present this to the auditors, it means less work needs to be done if you leverage the services that are already covered by like compliance. So you need to just go through the portion of the audits for your particular piece of uh, written code or application. But the underground, uh, beyond the scenes, like infrastructure, networking, and services already covered. So let's talk about EC2 in more details. First of all, there are a number of choices to for the compute. Either like a basic EC2, it's uh, virtual servers instances in the cloud, like virtual machines. We have Amazon ECS, EKS, and Fargate. So it's like Kubernetes uh, or Docker containers uh, services provided by Amazon. And Fargate is a managed service for running uh, Docker images and Docker containers on both of those services. And for, from services, serverless, sorry, perspective, we have AWS Lambda. It's serverless compute for stateless code execution, like based on some events. We'll talk in more details later during my presentation. Yeah, and from EC2 perspective, it's really, we have, we provide you with lots of choices and varieties what we support. So. Starting from operation system at Linux, Windows, Ubuntu, like many of those. We support different architectures starting from x86, like Intel AMD, and for newest generation based on the Graviton for ARM architecture. We have different types of uh, already kind of pre-backed uh, types of EC tools for general purpose usage, like CPU RAM and like some workload optimized, like GPU optimized, uh, networking optimized or storage optimized, just to allow you to choose based on your needs. Some additional features like bare metal, it's really like it's only owned by you piece of hardware where you could deploy whatever you need, like uh, your own hypervisor if needed and something like that. And we provide package, uh, packaged and community-driven AMI, so you could provide machine image for your EC2s by yourself and use this or, or even share this with the community. And multiple purchases options we discussed already on demand, the rise saving plan spot. 
So let's talk through the terminology itself. So we start from the AMI. It's basically, it's a configuration. It's not an instance of virtual machine itself. It's a configuration that is kind of source of what will be provisioned for you. It's from the virtual machine perspective. Next thing we call this instance, it's really running or stopped virtual machines originated from the configuration from AMI. So instance is your real virtual machine that is running. And after that, you use in particular region, in particular EZ, you have number of EBS. It's uh, your storage volumes attached to your instances. So, and just to wrap up, your instances are reside within VPCs from the network perspective, from the networking boundaries, in particular availability zone, in particular region. And we have EBS volumes attached to those instances as well, your disk volumes, and they're also tied to particular EZ. If you need to create snapshot of your storage, uh, you could use a, you could even like reattach EBS to different disk, uh, to different instance on the same, in the same availability zone or you would like to just archive it, you could create EBS snapshot that would be stored on S3, our object store bucket that is already durable and region-based. So basically that's it, yeah? So you have a configuration, you, based on that, you start uh, your instance, the, you attach volumes, storage volumes called EBS, in particular ability zone, in particular virtual private cloud, your network infrastructure boundary, in particular region, and you could leverage snapshot of that uh, to save on the costs. Alexander, sorry, yeah. this is Julia, yeah. the moderator. Yep, uh, we are a little bit out of time. So if we want to leave uh, time for questions, we have to finish. Uh, I thought that we, we have 10 more minutes, I believe. Yes, but th that time included includes time for Q&A session. So your time will end uh, at, uh, in six minutes. Oh, really? But anyway, I was there, I there have are... Five minutes. Uh, anyway, I suggest that you can continue now. And uh, if the okay. question will appear, I will just come on air and say you, tell you. Okay, okay. Thank for that. Yeah, Thank really, you. I was expecting 45 minutes. Okay. Okay, so I will uh, try to finish on where I could finish. So we have, from EC2 perspective, we have, it's called like virtual CPU. It's uh, like, it's not like CPU that you really come to because it's like core. So we have this hyper-threaded one, but usually you you really just use them and as many as you need. So just to let you know, we call this virtual CPU and it's hyper-threaded. Next is like about memory storage. We, it's represented in gigabytes. It's like different between gigabytes and gigabytes, but gigabytes, but usually gigabytes, it's like 10 in something and gigabytes is uh, like multiplication of power of two. Yeah, so basically, 256 gigabytes gives you even more that you expected. So that's, that's cool about that. Yeah, and one great thing is about like storage is independent of compute, as I mentioned. So you have instances in EBS and uh, kind of you could attach the same EBS to the different instance if you need to. Also, there is a ephemeral storage. It's like directly attached to your like physical rack and it have high performance NVMe, NVMe disks usually. From the sizing perspective, you use whatever you need, but from the cost perspective, it's all the same. So eight of X large instances is the same as like, I don't know, it's, it should be eight large, I believe. Yeah, so it's like multiplication flow. Two, two of four X large is really eight X large from the cost perspective and usage perspective. So you just could be using one large box or many small box, it will be the same linear usage based on the costs. Yeah, and one thing about EC2, it's really uh, all the instances are dedicated to you. And there is one exception for T instances, it's like burstable, they're like short. 
but all others are really dedicated to you and in your account and uh, memory located only to your instance. So you could be pretty sure it's you on the safe side from security perspective. So there is no something like an ability to avoid noisy neighbors issue. Also, we have plenty of choices for the process and architecture. As I mentioned, there, there is Intel-based, AMD-based, even like we support NVIDIA for GPUs. We have our own ARM processor called Graviton and even more. So you have whatever you need for all of your needs. This is a naming. So yeah, it's complex, but you just need to know. So it is instance family generation and like instance size. Yeah, you could refer to this later from the presentation. Yeah, I will just skip through that and just to show that there's plenty of choices from the instance size perspective based on the requirements. Many operation systems, so also not to list all of them, not covering all of them, but it's whatever you need for your workload, it's really you have and you could refer to the like additional ones from the marketplace baked by our partners and community. We really talk through the AMI, so it's your launch configuration, it's provided with a template of configs and how you call this and root volumes and how to map your EBS volumes to the instance. So basically just for one more recap to that. And once again, from the specialized workloads, especially from graphics perspective, is there is ability not to use full, full graphic, uh, like instance, but attach portion of that by using Elastic Graphics, Elastic Inference to the particular regular EC2 instance like M5, but benefit from the GPU portion provided and attached to you. So if you need to do some small piece for the GPU, we, you could leverage these uh, accelerators attached to your instance. We really covered uh, these purchase options and just a nice picture of those. It's, uh, you could refer to exact details of how you save. Spot instance could give you up to 90% of on-demand prices. Yeah, but there are some caveats there. And this is a great picture that represents how you usually should consider in what type of the purchase option to use. So baseline, you know, is always there for reserved instances or saving plans. Uh, orange one is on demand for your spiky workloads or for like even more scaling or for some sporadic and ad hoc workloads, you could use spot instances or you could use spot instances for your dev workloads because it's like not critical e workload and you could restart your workload. For example, it's where spots are really great. And one more thing is about uh, hibernation. It allows you really, when you like close your laptop and open this up, this is what really, and you continue from where you left off. It's really, it's about hibernation. Yeah, so you, it dumps your memory to the root volume. And when you start your instance, it just uh, reloads your memory from the dump from the, when you stop that. So it's available for most of the instances. It's uh, leverage the same start stop API. So it's all that supported. But it's really great when you could, uh, for your like heavy lifted or stateful applications, uh, not to restart everything from scratch. It's really a useful feature. Yeah, many instance types, whatever I could tell to that. So many capabilities, many categories and options. So. Yeah, you have something to choose from. Yeah, something to gravitate on. It's really, I think, the last thing I will be able to cover today. So we have second generation called Graviton 2, and it's really our latest generation. It's like M6, C6, R6, uh, G processors uh, that is based on ARM architecture and provides you more performance with a lower price in like in some performance testing, it could you allow you to do like 30% savings up to 30% savings, like up to 40% of performance. And it's like, and it's available for EC2 instances and for, you could leverage this from RDS, our database by clicking on the button and switching that instance type. So it's really something you need to be 
looking into and trying these days if you're really not so if it's easy for you to i mean recompile for arm architecture really because you will be getting more performance uh with less price yeah this is uh, just recaps what i've just mentioned alexander this is julie again yeah yeah, uh, sorry I could to, stop to here. interrupt. Yes, but uh, we have to stop because the next uh, speech will start in three minutes. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think that those who will have questions can reach you outside the conference and find you somehow in social yeah, networks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.